Welcome back to the Elvis and Kathy series. I'm glad to have you with me. I've noticed that on some of these videos that go 30 minutes, there is about 30% of you that watch the whole video, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, and I, I think that Kathy Westmullen does that as well, or Suzanne Finstead, or Johnny Lang when you guys watch the whole video. Uh, there's so much that you miss if you only watch part of it. So, um, I'll, you know, I'll probably put this as the very introduction. If you do see a um a commercial pop up it's gonna probably pop up every four or five minutes just watch 15 seconds until you skip it and then get on with the rest of the book don't feel like you got to turn away and close it out you don't scare don't, don't let it scare you if you see something that says three minutes long or five minutes long you don't have to watch all that they let you skip after 10 seconds or something like that all right tcb tlc this is rare with photos hope you enjoy the book all right everybody we are on to our next next uh, segment of elvis and kathy um, you guys have definitely tuned in to read this book with me. Uh, it's definitely the most popular videos on my channel recently. Uh, a lot of you really love uh, reading along with Child Bride as well. Army Days, there are, there's one video on Army Days so far uh, that I'd like to go take a look at after you watch this video. Uh, give Johnny Lang some attention because he was with Elvis in these days. Not as scandalous as, um, some of these other books who were touching or maybe details you haven't heard. But actually, there's going to be details you haven't heard in this My Army Days with Elvis book. Um, so I think where we left off in this Elvis and Kathy book, um, she was just getting uh, reminiscing about being on the plane after finding out that Elvis Presley had passed. And um, so... And let's just go ahead and she was reminiscing about uh, how her mind turned back to Las Vegas the morning after her first visit. So um, the day that he passed away was the first day, I believe, that she met him as well years earlier. All right. So page 30. I remember so well how I felt when I woke up. I had been dreaming a vivid, colorful Disney dream. Hearing this song, a dream is your wish, your heart makes. Uh, was I Cinderella? He certainly was Prince Charming. In the light of day, everything seemed more clear, and I felt I had my strange feelings under control. I was surprised at the way my mind had been working the sleepless night before. So, this was the night after the kiss uh, that she had with Elvis, her first, first kiss. First and foremost my, was my upbringing. Because of my father's position within a church, I had spent most of my formative years attending Sunday school or singing at the choir. I also had been a steady churchgoer, even as a teenager, because attending all church functions was mandatory in our household. Um, I attended the Southern Methodist Church for 10 years, was a member of the Congregational Church for one year, and 10 years in a Baptist Church. My daily diet of morality was now a part of me. Sex before marriage was simply not condoned by me nor any church I had ever attended. But one of the most sinful things of all was to commit adultery. And Elvis was very married no matter what he said about his arrangement with Priscilla. And he was the father of a child. Additionally, or actually this was the most sobering thought of all, having an affair with a married man. I feared the consequences much more than I had feared losing my virginity. I vowed then and there that I would never see Elvis Presley socially again, and I certainly wouldn't be alone with him in his bedroom. Uh, that settled, I felt better. After all, I reasoned I was a grown woman with a mind of her own, a career that I loved, and I didn't need to complicate my life. Besides, the days were going by very fast, and soon the Las Vegas show would close. Elvis would go on tour and I would return home to Los Angeles. I decided I should tell him as soon as possible. Well, the show went on as usual. Elvis was charged up a real dynamo. Afterwards, one of the bodyguards came up to me and said, Elvis wanted me to come up to a suite again. I said yes, knowing that I needed to tell him how I felt and what I had decided would be best for the both of us. Now, have y'all been in that position before where you know you shouldn't do something you're going to do it anyways, but you're going to say the reason why you're doing it is because of this. And then you go up there and you do the thing that you're not supposed to do. Yeah, that's what I think she was going through right there. Uh, when I arrived, more than a little anxious, the suite was filled with people laughing and talking as usual. As soon as Elvis saw me, he took me by the hand and said, Hi, sweetheart. I missed you. I couldn't wait to see you again. It felt so good knowing you were on stage with me. Man, oh man, what, why couldn't they have sent me a big ugly chick who could sing? Uh, you know, you're so little you're hidden in the back i want you up front with the sweet inspirations tomorrow night so they can see you well i wanted to speak out but evidently the television was a little too loud for him and he yelled over to charlie hodge charlie turn that television down it's too loud with that one of the girls in the, in the room yelled back why don't you do it yourself 
Elvis was stunned, and then I saw tears welling up his eyes. Why did she, why did she say that to me? He had a pained look on his face, and I could see he was very hurt. Hmm. It made me feel terrible to see him like that. You know, and I touched him on the shoulder. She didn't mean anything by that. She was just trying very hard to get your attention. He thought about it for a moment, and then smiled at me. I guess you're right. Kathy, you're so good for me. You help me see things the way they really are. After that, we both left the room and went into his bedroom. I took his hand and I looked at him. I had to tell him how I felt. Elvis, I, I have to tell you. I can't see you anymore. I just, I just don't feel right. I, I care for you very much, but Elvis put his fingers to my lips. Shh, I know, I know. Just relax. I'm not forcing you to do anything you don't want to do. I need you as a friend, Kathy. So don't worry, please. Okay, baby? Now here's the book that I was telling you about. Then he handed me a copy of Impersonal Life, and inside the cover he'd written to Kathy with love always, EP. He had purposely misspelled the word always, making it all ways instead. I was thrilled, and I thanked him. Uh, he took the book from me and began reading me some excerpts. He began turning the pages, and his excitement was obvious. Uh, listen to this, he said. I am not your intellect and body. And this message is to teach you that you and I are one. Uh, the words I hear and speak and the main burden of these instructions is to awaken your consciousness uh, to this great fact. Now Elvis leaned closer to me. You cannot awaken to this fact until you can't get away from the consciousness of the body and the intellect, which so long have held you enslaved. You must feel me within before you can know I am there. Now on the next page, uh, it tells you how to do it, Elvis read again. Uh, sit quietly in a relaxed position, and then wholly at ease. Let your mind take in the significance of these words. Be still and know I am God, I said. That's always been one of my favorite biblical scriptures and one of my favorite gospel hymns. Do you know that song? He nodded yes and went on to say, Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is his hand, not far off right here. Elvis emphasized it by looking at his outstretched hand. Then clasping his hands to his chest, he quietly quoted, The kingdom of heaven is within you. We went on from one topic to another, but always ending up on the subject that interested us most, spiritual awakening. Then I guess I was beginning to look tired because he took me by the hand and led me back to my room, kissed me gently on the mouth and said goodnight. Before I went to sleep, the phone rang and it was Elvis. Kathy? I feel just like I was in high school again. Uh, do you feel the same way? How do you feel? Yes, I said, I feel that way too. And then we talked some more. I was ecstatic about finding a man that I could share my favorite topics with. Uh, with God and music. It was, if I, it, was, it was if I could never run out of things to say to one another. We could never run out of things. He asked me to come up to the penthouse after the show the next day. And this time there wasn't any hesitation on my part when I said yes. I was surprised at how quickly I had responded to his request. Was there any point at all of making strong resolves when it came to Elvis? No matter how many lectures I gave myself, it seemed that every uh, determined resolution went out the window where he was concerned. The next night after the show, I returned to the penthouse suite. And uh, there were some of the same people and some new faces, but I wasn't looking at them. Elvis walked up to me, put his arm around my shoulders, and led me to his private suite. Actually, the suite was always so filled with people that the bedroom was the only place we could be that gave us privacy. He started talking to me again about all sorts of things. I'm afraid I don't remember what exactly, but I do know I loved the sound of his voice and the way that he looked at me. All I want to do is get to know you better as a friend, I remember him saying. And of course I agreed. Tired of sitting on the little sofa, he led me to the bed and assured me it was all right. Nothing will happen unless you want it to, he promised, which didn't exactly ease my fears. Suddenly he said, I want you to stay all night with me, Kathy. I don't think so, I said, shaking my head. I promise you nothing will happen unless you want it to, just, just like I said. And somehow I felt like he was telling me the truth, so I decided to stay. Now, this may sound silly, but I realized that Elvis was a very lonely man. He was surrounded by some pretty superficial thinkers. 
Although he, he enjoyed talking about a variety of subjects, his interests were so varied and so widespread, and he pursued his studies so intensely that I felt very sorry for him living in a goldfish bowl environment without much freedom to do what he wanted. But no matter how I rationalized, the plain fact is that I really wanted to stay. We began gently caressing, kissing, talking sweetly, and holding each other so closely, we were like one. And because of the intense passion of the moment, I was sure uh, I was sure he'd even want more from me, but he remained true to his promise. Uh, still, there was so much conflict within me, and I know he sensed that too. I felt guilty, denying him the physical love that he needed. I wondered how long he would be patient with me. Would I lose his love and even his friendship? Would he look for satisfaction from someone else? The questions my heart kept asking were too painful to think about, but he had broken down an important barrier, and I'm sure he realized that as much as I did. We drifted off to sleep, and I woke up several times that night only to find Elvis also awake and looking at me. Isn't it odd uh, how, how often we wake up at the same time? Elvis asked, smiling sweetly. I agreed that it was odd, and it did happen to us many times after that. We seemed to be aware of each other, that we sensed we uh, that we each sensed the slightest movement and even knew when the other simply opened his or her eyes. No matter what I felt that night, warmed by Elvis's arms and body, I was filled with guilt the next day. I thought everyone would think that we had been having wild sex, and I was mortified, but nobody reacted at all. It was as if he hadn't noticed a thing, and gradually, as the day wore on, I became more relaxed. The next night was much the same. We slept together, again, and much to my chagrin, I felt very safe in this new role. I felt so secure as if nothing in the world could happen to me or touch me as long as Elvis was there to hold me through the night. Well, to be honest, there wasn't much night uh, really left the next time we got to sleep. Remember, we didn't finish work until two o'clock, and that was in the morning, and then we would unwind for an hour or so, which meant it was nearly always 4 a.m. before we tried to go to sleep. Our routine was to go to bed in the early morning hours and sleep until late afternoon. Before we went to bed, Elvis would give me one of his pajama tops to sleep in because I didn't feel comfortable bringing a nightgown of my own to the bedroom. He was always very solicitous and hospitable, almost fatherly about my well-being. He would set a glass of water on my nightstand, also a toothbrush, and he always asked before joining me in the bed if there was anything else that I needed. I always felt he was really looking after me and was honestly concerned about my comfort and welfare. Elvis suffered from chronic insomnia and had for years, which is pretty general knowledge. One of the major causes of this was the fact that his mind was continually working. He just couldn't seem to turn it all off. He would think of adding songs to the show or worry about somebody's welfare, think of God, spiritual growth, an old hymn, something in his childhood, a motion picture he just worked on or just trivia. He found it impossible to just shut his mind off and go to sleep. He was also a uh, somnambulist. Which I've got no clue, to be honest, what that is, folks. Somnambulist. Probably should look it up. Give me a second here. It's probably important. We know what I'm talking about here. What, what I'm reading. Somnambulist. If y'all know, you can be putting it in the... Okay, Sleepwalker. Come on, Kathy. You could have just put Sleepwalker. Come on, Kathy Westmoreland. Somnambulist. It felt like he was maybe like a Buddhist for a second. Uh, we would get up and have breakfast in the penthouse bedroom or dining room. I usually had eggs or easy, two slices of bacon, toast, coffee, and orange juice. Elvis would order a Spanish omelet and an entire pound of bacon with black coffee or toast uh, and toast or saltine crackers. He made a big thing out of that bacon and he only ate a portion of it. It may have had a lot to do with the fact that he'd grown up so poor and they couldn't afford bacon. Now, this is an interesting little statement. This was written in 87. I remember Linda Thompson in an interview saying the same thing. Did she say it because she knew it? Did she say it because she read this book? It may have had a lot to do with the fact that he had grown up so poor and they couldn't afford bacon. And he, you know, that he would have, a, uh, the, the story goes, Linda Thompson went down and made Elvis breakfast. I think Elvis asked her to. So he went down and he brought, he, she brought up a normal sized breakfast, you know, three or four eggs, three or four or five slices of bacon, something like that. And he wanted more. He's, you know, and, and he didn't eat it. 
he just wanted to know he could have it because he grew up so poor. Uh, which is interesting. It's a security blanket. Okay, so continuing on page 37 here. Also, he didn't want to call for another order of bacon, only to wait for an hour or longer for room service to show up with it. So by ordering a pound, bacon was always there if he wanted it, but he never ate a whole pound at once. There had been a lot of surprises since I joined the Elvis show, uh, but what was really mind-boggling to me was the way that Elvis fans reacted to him. It was almost like worship in a way and a complete acceptance of the man. One morning, when he was showering and I was still in bed listening to him singing at the top of his lungs, I thought about this and then put my thoughts into words. Elvis, it's simply amazing to me to think how much power you have over people. I waited, thinking he hadn't heard me. But then he came out of the shower and he walked over me. Walked over to me. His eyes were serious and his face, still wet from the shower, looked almost boyish, but his answer was a thoughtful one. I guess I could have influence over people's thinking, he said. I guess I could influence them a lot, but I think it's more important for me uh, just to entertain. No heavy message, make people happy, uh, help them forget all their troubles for a while. I think that's what I'm on this earth to do. I'll never forget that conversation. Because there were always people out there who wanted entertainers to influence voters or to preach causes. And to stop right there... You know, they did ask Elvis to run for president. There was a, there was a caucus about it, and, and I know that I read several different places that they thought maybe they could get Elvis to run and they would have a great uh, chance of winning. Uh, I feel, I really feel like it was the Republican Party, um, although it could have been the Democrat. I mean, the Democrats back then were almost today's Republicans a little bit. Anyways, that's politics. We won't, we won't get into that. But I, the, fact that, the fact of the matter is that they considered him uh, a very serious possibility to be able to run for the office of the presidency uh it might have been the late 60s early 70s all right elvis took his responsibility seriously and more than any other star in show business he could have swayed his fans in any direction but while he felt it was fine for the other entertainers to take a stand on public issues if they so desired he didn't think that it was right for him elvis presley to take advantage of his power to mold public opinion, which is way different than today. What do we have? We had Taylor Swift come out uh, voicing her support of Kamala Harris, I think, after the debate. Um, and there's other entertainers that have done it, too, on one side or the other. But Elvis wasn't like that. He didn't feel like people needed to vote because Elvis thought so. He wanted people to have their own mind, to make their own choices, not to be influenced or swayed by other people. I think that's a, a great example uh, of how different he was and how much deeper of a thinker he was than people like Taylor Swift and others. Uh, Charlie Hodge, Red West, Joe Esposito, and Sonny West would often join us for breakfast. Then Elvis and I would go back to bed, perhaps read or talk or get some sun if it wasn't unbearably hot on the terrace. If we decided to sun, Elvis would rub some suntan lotion on me because he was afraid that I would burn. Uh, he would dip cotton pads in which hazel for both of us. Witch hazel, yeah. I've had that before, and would place these pads on our eyes to protect the delicate skin in that area. Sometimes he would dig out little egg-shaped goggles and then laugh at how I looked with those crazy-looking things on my face. He got a kick out of that. Afterwards, I would go to my room and get ready for the show. When the show was over at 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the morning, the routine would start all over again. I remember one morning in the suite, Elvis, Charlie, and I were around the piano when we'd where we loved to gather and sing. Elvis started playing the piano, which wasn't unusual. I'd heard him play many times before during our gospel sing songs, but I was surprised and impressed to hear him playing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, and he played it quite beautifully. That's a fact I didn't know. I know a lot about Elvis, just like y'all. I've heard a lot about it, watched shows, TV, movies, documentaries, read a lot of books, but I didn't know that he played Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Hmm. It's pretty deep right there. Rock and roller. Popular singer. When Elvis was determined to learn something, he wouldn't let anything stop him. He practiced that piece until he got it down perfectly. Later that afternoon on the terrace, Elvis and I began discussing gospel music and how it had influenced our lives. We compared favorite singers and one we both agreed on. Sorry, favorite songs. One we both agreed on was How Great Thou Art. He grinned when he said... The only album I ever won a Grammy uh, for was a gospel album. 
The title was uh, How Great Thou Art. We started humming it, and then we sang it as a duet, and we were children again. I love it. Let's do it again. We sang it again, and with his unusual enthusiasm, he said, Let's put it in the show, Kathy. A gospel hymn in a Las Vegas show? Well, I don't know. But when Elvis decided to do something, he didn't waste time mulling it over. Charlie, he called out from over the terrace. We have to have a quick rehearsal. There's a song I want to put in the show tonight. Years before, Charlie had helped Elvis create a special dynamic arrangement of How Great Thou Art. So he called for a fast rehearsal, and suddenly it was part of the show. And so, and so it was that Elvis made a real breakthrough in Las Vegas. He broke away from the usual pattern and put in a gospel hymn. When the audience heard it that night, they went wild and they gave him a rousing standing ovation. And Elvis just smiled and winked at me as if to say, see, I knew they like our kind of music, Kathy. Even the people who come to Las Vegas are just like me. Well, how great the art, it stayed in the show. And I always felt a little proud that I had helped contribute something to his performance. The Las Vegas run was about to close. And although I hated it for, hated for all of it to end, I was prepared to go home had accepted some studio dates and realized that my life would resume its normal course once I was back in Los Angeles. On the other hand, I was relieved and on the other on the other hand, I, would, I never wanted it to be over. I was so torn and confused about leaving the show. But fate intervened. Millie Kirkham, who I had thought was coming back, wasn't really coming back at all. Everybody knew that in the first place, but <laughs> didn't want to offer me the whole tour until they saw how I fit in. I was on trial and they wanted to see how I worked Anyways, there was a chance to do the entire tour and stay with Elvis, or go home and chalk it up to just another life experience, one that I would always cherish and remember. Uh, come on tour with us. Uh, stay with the show, Elvis pleaded. I hate the road. I really think I should go home, was my reply. I was trying to be sensible about the entire situation. Uh, stay with the show. I promise you we won't travel more than twice a year. Uh, nothing tiring, and we will have fun. Elvis continued to plead, but that was funny to begin with, and I should have gone home. Uh, Elvis saying that the tours wouldn't be tiring. Come on. Elvis couldn't walk into a room without causing havoc. All of his shows were dynamic, exciting, and being around him was like chasing a shooting star. However, I gave in. I said I would stay, and he was like a little boy at Christmas. But then he was always like that when he got his way, which was most of the time. I don't know how I thought things would work out, but love does strange things to your mind, even the mind of a sensible person, as I had always been. Here I was, Kathy Westmoreland, sleeping every night with a married man, not having sex, and going back on the road again, which I vowed never to do. In fact, everything I vowed never to do, I was doing. I was angry and pleased with myself at the same time. It was all so con complex and bewildering. And yet another problem had arisen near the end of the Las Vegas engagement, Elvis had received a death threat from an obviously mentally disturbed man. He had drawn a gun on a photograph right over Elvis's heart. Now, this wasn't the first threat on Elvis's life. It was one, but it was one that everybody was uh, taking very, very seriously. Uh, the man, including Elvis, the man wanted to be paid off. Vernon considered paying him, but a precedent would have been set and he, uh, Decided against it. Sorry, I'm looking something up real quick. Um, Elvis was nervous and mentioned it at, all the time. The fear was like a raging river and he just couldn't shake it. There were extra security that were placed in the audience. And there was an ambulance waiting outside by the stage door in case of an emergency. Not only that, but the entire cast was told to hit the floor if we heard or saw anything unusual. Um, so this is pretty nerve wracking for any entertainer while they're given a performance. And it did bother Elvis because he would sit in bed and study that photograph, wondering over and over. I can't believe it. Why would this guy want to kill me? I've been so upset. I can't even go to the bathroom and he couldn't sleep. Hold me, Kathy. I need you. I need you to make me feel peaceful. You, you calm me down. So I said, I believe God will protect you if we ask him to. So we held hands and prayed that God would protect him. Well, I was going to stop, but I'm going to read read for five, five more minutes at least for you guys. 
that way maybe we get to the end of a chapter perhaps or an end of a thought i think over here is a good end of the thought so so let's continue um then he held then he told me that the men would sometimes ask him for his autograph and when he was occupied signing something they would try to take a punch at him he couldn't understand this kind of violence luckily the man who had drawn the gun on the photograph didn't follow through on his threat but that occurrence was just the beginning of many such incidents which i will go into later there were three planes on every tour one of them was for the singers in the band and one for colonel parker and his staff who always left for the next city a day earlier than the rest of us. The other plane was for Elvis, his bodyguards, and whoever else that Elvis wanted with him. He said, I want you to ride on the plane with me to Phoenix. Now, before you say yes, it's only fair to warn you that once you get on that plane with me, instead of the show plane, everybody will know we're together. I'll think about that, I said. But I knew uh, what my choice would be. I wanted to fly with Elvis. I also knew uh, that by going on the plane with Elvis to Phoenix, I was announcing to the world, or at least my world and the world around Elvis, that Elvis and I were an item, and that we were more than just friends. And I hoped he could that he could he could handle that. So okay, so this has to be 1971. It has to be before Linda Thompson, right? Let's see here. I'm gonna I'm gonna look this up real quick. Westmoreland joins Elvis. Because we know that Linda Thompson said Elvis was faith, faithful um, to her for the first year. And of course, yeah, 1970. So August 16th, 1970 is when, when Kathy joined. Um, so this had to be 1970 or early 71. So interesting. And, and, you know, and maybe y'all knew that already, but I wanted to just definitely go through it and make sure that I knew it. Okay. So I'll think about that. Then Elvis and I were an item, and we were more than just friends, and I only hope I could handle that. Elvis and I were also very concerned about keeping this affair from the press, as he should be. They were married, Priscilla and Elvis. Well, regardless of what Priscilla was doing, this is two years after the comeback special, by the way, too. So we know Priscilla continued her affairs with other people. She might have even been with Mike Stone at this point. Um... And once again, that closing night, he walked to me off stage just to, as I had to go on, his eyes twinkling and a mischievous grin on his face and said in a low voice, uh, Well, are you going to have an affair with a married man? I wish I, I wish he hadn't said that. It made me realize just where our relationship might lead. I didn't say anything, but how could I have replied when my legs suddenly felt as if they had turned into water? I walked out, took my place at the microphone, feeling lightheaded and dizzy. My dilemma must have uh, shown on my face because he gave me a big smile, a wink, and then the show began. I said, see, 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 right. Uh, th that night, I went to my room to pack up all my things, feeling more alone than I'd ever been in my life. I felt guilty, humiliated, demeaned. I called home and talked to my mother. I'm in love with a married man. I heard myself saying it in a choked up voice. My sweet, cheerful, and very wise mother listened quietly then she said, you have to do what you think is right, Kathy, and I know you'll do that. You must live with your own life and make your own decisions. Feeling better, I packed up to go on the road. Next stop was Phoenix and Arizona Sun. I felt alive and filled with excitement, but in the secret part of my mind, I harbored the fear that I might be headed for hell. The start of the trip to Phoenix was worse than I thought it would be. I blush even now when I think of it. I was planning on riding in Elvis's plane later in the day, but nobody knew that. So the band bus is going to the airport, and they waited for me. When they called to see why I was late, they were told I would be on Elvis's plane. So they headed off to the airport without me, and most people by then knew that I hadn't taken the bus reserved for the troop. They might have suspected something up at something up to that time, although they had no way of knowing for certain that what they had heard was only gossip. But the minute I got on the plane which was a customized Fairchild with Elvis, I had crossed an invisible line in the star structure and everybody knew what was going on. In the limo riding from the Phoenix airport to the uh, hotel, Elvis was also in a better mood. Oh man, I'm glad I'm alive. That jerk will have to live with the fact that he didn't get me. He said jubilantly. So I was a little less depressed when I arrived in Phoenix, at least about touring and all the other worries and problems that were still with me. And to make matters worse, there was a bomb threat and an argument with Elvis yet to come. 
After Elvis and I settled in his room, I told him I wanted to go over the show arena with a group of the band, with the group on the band bus. Uh, you don't have to do that, honey, he said. You can wait and go over with me. Uh, you know, you don't go on until I do, so why don't you just stay now and have dinner with me? Well, I want to keep things on a professional level with the rest of the group, I replied, and keep everything as normal as possible. Well, he understood. I got on the bus with the rest of the band, and as we were pulling up to the Phoenix Civic Auditorium, he, we were dumbfounded to witness over 18,000 people marching in mass out of the auditorium instead of going in. Everyone was being cleared out so they could search the entire place after it was empty. Oh my God, no, I thought, realizing they were going to search every person on the bus as well. The city officials were making certain we were unarmed or weren't hiding a bomb. There is something very distasteful but very necessary about having strangers search you as if you're some kind of a killer. This was my first experience in that kind of situation, and all the bodyguards warned me not to say a word to Elvis about the threat. The gun episode in Las Vegas had made him so upset and nervous that they felt telling him about a bomb threat right after the gun incident was just too much. So I didn't say a word to Elvis and tried not to show how nervous I was. I also found out that playing a huge arena like the one in Phoenix was much different than playing a hotel in Las Vegas. There were thousands and thousands of fans in the big auditorium and they were screaming for Elvis, all of them. It was absolute turmoil. The bomb scare was really frightened. Uh, the bomb scare had really frightened me so much it was difficult to concentrate. After seeing that unruly mob of people, it made me realize that anything could happen. Anything was possible. Of course, by the next morning, Elvis had read about the bomb threat in the newspaper and he was really angry with me. First, he woke up swearing and yelling. Then I heard him out in the hall talk loudly to the security guard outside. He slammed the door and called room service for more newspapers. I want all the Phoenix newspapers. Give me the damn every, every damn one of them, he said and slammed down the phone. When we were delivered, when they were delivered, he rifled through them, looked and mumbled and swore to himself, but loud enough to keep me awake. Uh, first, this son of a bitch in Las Vegas wants to kill me, and now some idiot wants to blow me to pieces? Why? He looked over at me, and his blue eyes were blazing with anger. Uh, did you know about this bomb? His voice was cold, and I, I wanted to stand at the covers and ignore his questions, but he asked me again. Uh, I, well, I knew, but I didn't want to admit that I knew. Uh, why didn't you tell me about it? His voice was cold with anger. Well, nobody wanted to tell you because it might worry you after Las Vegas. And the threat there was my answer. Everybody told me not to say anything to you. This sounded like an even weaker excuse when I heard myself say it out loud. Uh, that's no excuse as far as you are concerned. Uh, you should have told me. Uh, how can I ever trust you if you don't tell me important things like that, Kathy? Uh, don't ever keep anything from that. Don't, don't ever keep anything from me again, you hear? His voice was still angry. He hadn't uh, liked my weak excuse either. Let's leave it right there. So that way you wonder, how does this fight resolve? Do they make up? What's going on here? Um, and um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. And once again, thanks again, TCB TLC. Till next time, take care of yourselves. Uh, take care of those around you. And uh, keep defending Elvis. And uh, make sure you stand up for yourselves as well.